Yeah, y'all are trained. <laughs> ben has got y'all prepared for for the long haul. So. Well, let's turn to, we're going to go through a couple of scriptures. Um, turn to Philippians chapter 3, start off with, and we're going to be talking about uh, not trusting in ourselves, you know, but trusting in Christ. And uh, a lot of times we can drift into a uh, uh, having a confidence in ourselves, trusting in our past works. Well, I've been doing this and I've been doing that instead of, you know, what Christ has done. And if we get our mind and our hearts off of what Jesus did for us and we start thinking about what uh, we've done for Jesus. <laughs> and that's not what's significant to us. It ought to be that uh, our minds are continually brought back to what the Lord has done for us and not trust in like the song, uh, uh, dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. You know, and that's what we need to need to remember. In Philippians chapter three, Paul, uh, we're going to start off in verse verse three. Paul is trying to um, trying to contrast himself. How he, if anybody could trust in the works of the flesh, Paul could do it. So if if we think that we can have confidence in the flesh. Paul could outdo us, and, and he's telling us in this passage that that's not where it's at. But Philippians 3, verse 3, he says, We are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law a Pharisee concerning zeal persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless but those things which were I'm sorry those things were gain what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ yea doubtless and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And so here... We see Paul, uh, you know, in his unsaved uh, pre-Christian state uh, was zealous in the Jews' religion. You know, he was a Jewish man and he was uh, more exceeding zealous, he said in Galatians, than, than even those that were uh, his, his equals. He was more zealous than they were. He was more uh, exceeding zealous to the point that he persecuted the church of Christ, which in their mind was a cult. They viewed Christianity as a as a deviation of Judaism, you know, that they rejected Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. They rejected that Jesus was the sacrifice that that shed his blood for the for the remission of our sins. They didn't accept that. They didn't even understand it. They accept they rejected that Jesus Christ was the incarnate uh, God manifested in the flesh, their Messiah, the word made flesh. They rejected that. They thought Jesus was a, a false teacher. They thought that he didn't rise again from the dead. They thought that the disciples stole his body, or they at least said that. You know, And so they tried to stop the, the uh, creation of the Christian faith. But, you know, Jesus said, I will build my church, right? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So regardless of what the devil did, he could not stop the church. His church was going to be built. The power of God manifested in his people was not going to stop. You know, and we can have that same confidence in our lives that, that the excellency of the power is of God and not of us. God is the one that causes us to triumph. And so let's trust the, uh, the power of his resurrection working in us to give us the victory, to cause us to overcome whatever it is that we're facing. But the church could not be stopped. The church continued to grow even though it was had the full force of the state the Roman Empire against it. It had the Jewish, uh, uh, the Jews religion. It had the, the Jewish state against it. And it flourished under that, under that persecution. Maybe that's what we need in America is a, some persecution to flourish the church. But it could not stop the church. 
And so Paul was on the front lines of trying to stop and, and kill Christians and have them thrown in prison and have them blaspheme the Lord and reject and deny him. And he became, uh, by the power of God, he became uh, the most uh, zealous uh, of the proponents of Christianity, the most zealous apostle. He labored more abundantly than all those that were apostles before him. And so that's what God can do. You know, you think about, I'm, I'm, yeah, sometimes I hear people say, well, I, if I come into church, the lightning will strike or the building will collapse or, you know, I'm so sinful that if I enter into the building, you know, bad things are about to happen, you know. And it's like, God's not afraid of your sin. <laughs> Where your sin abounds, his grace does much more about it. So God, it doesn't matter how wicked or vile that you think you are. If you repent, he can forgive you of all of your sins and wash you from all of your trespasses, all of your iniquities, and he can make you a new creature. So it doesn't matter uh, how wicked we were. So let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God delights in mercy. God wants to, to glorify his grace. God wants his, his uh, grace to be magnified, and it's done through sinners repenting. So don't think that, uh, you know, you're so bad, you know, that God can't, uh, he can't save you. That's just a lack of faith. You know, that's the God, if, if you're not forgiven today, it's not because God's not willing, it's because you don't believe. You know, the blood of Jesus Christ, he said, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You say, well, I just can't forgive myself. Well, then you don't have faith in the blood. You don't believe that, that the cross of Jesus Christ was enough. You've got to add something to it. Can you imagine that? God said that he set forth Christ to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. And you're, and you're like, I know that. But, you know, I'm just, I, I've got to do something. I've I got to feel bad. I've got to make it worse. I've got to do something. It's not enough that I can just receive the forgiveness of sins. You know, but that's that's an insult to God. God has set Christ out and said that that He is He finished the work that 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 His blood washes us from our sins. But the Jews didn't like that, and to this day they don't like that. They they don't believe that to this day. They still do not accept Christ. They will. That's what the tribulation period is going to be about. That God's going to turn them back to uh, Christ. But at this point, they were as zealous against um, uh, Christ as had ever been in the history of the church. And Paul was right there persecuting the church. And so he says, if you're going to have confidence in the flesh, then he said, uh, look, look at me, because I can have more confidence than you can have. Because the Jews were given the oracles of God, and Paul said, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You know, I was a Pharisee, meaning that he believed that this, it was the strictest sect of the law. He believed everything that he was supposed to believe and he did everything he was supposed to do. He's touching the righteousness which was in the law. He was blameless. Like he kept the Sabbath. He kept the Passover. You know, he kept the feast days. He went into the temple. He, he did everything he was supposed to do. And see, this is what happens when we start to trust in ourselves. We start to put confidence in our efforts and in our works. And we miss the whole point. So here Christ is... Uh, the sacrifice for our sins. And that was symbolized and, and figured in times past through the sacrifices of, of the Levitical priesthood. They shed blood for thousands of years. And that was pointing to Christ. God said that the blood of bulls and of goats would never take away sins. So the point of them shedding that blood was not to take away their sins. Because it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. But Christ came and he was the what that was pointing to. He was the fulfillment of those shadows and those figures. Christ's death was what those sacrifices were pointing to. So can you imagine that the Jews were keeping the fulfillment, I'm, I'm sorry, the shadows and rejecting the fulfillment? And they're ba uh, boasting and bragging about that they have... Uh, kept the sacrifices, they've kept the feast days, they've made all the offerings, and, and they start boasting in it and glorying in that. And then they kill the, the Lamb of God. It's like, you missed the whole point. And this is what happens when we trust in ourselves. We start leaning in our own understanding. We start trusting in our righteousness. We're going to be the ones that are persecuting the Lord or the Lord's work, and we're going to be the ones that are trying to stop the Lord's work because of vainglory. You know, when you trust in yourself, you get puffed up. You start thinking, 
you know, I, I, I'm better than they and, you know, I, I'm greater than, than my ministry is better than his ministry and I, I speak better than him and I pray more than her and, and I fast more frequently. And, you know, we, we start getting into this uh, uh, competition, this spiritual competition when we trust in ourselves. And we're going to see that that's the case, that when, whenever you start trusting in yourselves, it's automatic. You start comparing yourself with other people. You start tearing down other people. You start backbiting. You start slandering. You start being envious of other people. And so we don't want to fall into that. We want to keep our eyes focused on Christ and realize that we have nothing. We have no efforts, no power, no, no confidence in ourselves that's worth anything to God. Anything that we have, Paul said that, the, that it's not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So anything that he did, he said it was it's not I, but Christ that lived it. So we need to realize that and not have any confidence in the flesh. But he said if anybody could boast in the flesh that he could do it more. But he said in verse um, 8, he counted all those things but loss, but dung rather. But he, he suffered the loss of all things. And he realized that even though as far as from the natural perspective, it looks like Paul is a, he's a great guy. You know, he's a, one of the leading you know, people in the in the community. He's always the one that's at the, the, the synagogue on time. You know, he's probably opening the doors to the synagogue and he's in there praying. He's in there, uh, you know, doing everything he needs to do. And everybody else could look at that and say, wow, what a nice guy. And the Lord looks at it and say, what a wicked and vile and filthy sinner. You say, man, the Lord sees things a little bit differently than we do. And we're going to see that because Paul would have been one of the very ones and was one of the very ones that was trying to stop God himself, the work of God. So when we trust in ourselves, we become the enemies of God. We start to oppose the work of God. We start to try to resist the move of God. That's just automatic. That's what happens. When you start leaning into your own understanding, you start boasting in yourself, you start putting confidence in the flesh, you immediately become the enemy of God. You immediately begin to resist the work of God. And so Paul said that he was not going to be found in Christ having, notice he says, having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So turn over to Romans chapter 9. So we're going to see that the, not just Paul, but the entire Jewish state, the entire Jewish nation, the people of God, missed the righteousness of God. You know, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. And most people uh, don't want to hear that. You know, they don't want to hear repent. They don't want to hear uh, turn from your sins. They want to hear, hey, God loves you. You're a good guy. You know, you're doing your best. You know, uh, just, you know, do, do the best you can. The Lord understands. He knows your heart. He sees your heart. And that's, that's the, the gospel of this uh, let's all get along uh, kind of humanism. You know, let's just all get along and you do what you want to do. I'll do what I want to do. And, and let's not, you know, let's not hold each other to account. Let's not, you know, try to uh, try to encourage one another in the things of God. Or let's not try to provoke one another to love and to good works, you know. And, and when you begin to say things like repent to people, they immediately are, are on the offensive. Because that is uh, basically an assault. They're already the enemies of God. You're just presenting that to them. You're saying, hey, you need to repent. God is your enemy. You are the enemy of God. You love yourself. You love your righteousness. And thereby, you hate the righteousness of God. And you're going to miss the righteousness of God. And so you don't want to be found in... Uh, you, want, you want to be found in Christ not having your righteousness, which is the efforts that you put forth in your own natural strength. You know, the natural man is at enmity against God. And so when we put... Uh, trust in ourselves and we tr start trying to, to uh, trust in our, the efforts of our natural strength and not in the power of the resurrection of Christ, then we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're establishing our own righteousness is what we're doing. We're trusting in ourselves that we're righteous. And this is exactly what the Jews did. They were keeping the law, but they were trusting in the fact that they were keeping the law. And when they were trusting in the fact they're keeping the law, they completely missed the righteousness of God. Now look, look in Romans chapter 9. Verse 30, it says, what shall we say then that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness, which is of faith. 
But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Christ is that stumbling stone. He's the rock of all things. They stumbled at him because they were following the law of righteousness, but they missed righteousness. And here the Gentiles are living after their sins, living after their lust, walking in the, uh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And they find righteousness, the righteousness, which is the faith, because they sought it by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's a faith that no man can glory in his presence. You know, God doesn't want any flesh to glory in his presence. And so the Gentiles, while they did not have the covenants, they did not have the law of God, they did not have the service of God, they didn't have the promises of God, they had nothing. But they found the righteousness which is of God by faith. The Jews had the law, they had the covenants, they had the Levitical priesthood, they had the sacrifices, they had the promises, and they completely missed it. They missed the righteousness which is by faith. Because they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Look, look how he goes on in chapter 10 here, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And you know, this is really insulting to people. When, when people are very zealous for, for God or their image of God, their definition of God... Um, we, we, you know, in the world, the world will say, oh, they're very zealous for God. You know, they're, look at how zealous they are. Look at how much energy and effort they're putting into the idea of God. And, and they're doing these works. But Paul said they don't have a zeal according to knowledge. And so you can have a zeal, but if you don't have any knowledge and you're just out there laboring in vain, then that's, that's useless. That's futile. That's not going to get you any, any treasures in heaven. And it's not going to uh, it's not going to please the Lord because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so you can have a lot of zeal, but we need to have a lot of knowledge to go along with a lot of zeal. And he says, in verse three, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So here they're ignorant of God's righteousness. They're trusting in themselves that they're righteous and they miss Christ. They're trying to establish their own righteousness. They're trying to do their own works. They're putting confidence in their flesh and they miss Christ. And so they've not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Well, the righteousness of God is received by faith. It's simply realizing that I have nothing to offer God, but God has everything to offer me. You know, it's not of him... Uh, that, that wills or him that runs with God that shows mercy. It's the mercies of God. You know, and so when Paul says that, to, uh, that we're justified by faith apart from the works of the law, he says, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So we have no righteousness. We have faith in God and God imputes righteousness to us. And now we have the righteousness of God. That's what salvation is. That's what justification is. So Christ is made unto us righteousness. So this is the, you know, technically what happens when we get saved. Our faith is counted for righteousness. God says, okay, you accept the fact that I'm telling you that you are a sinner. You accept the fact that I'm declaring unto you through the death of Christ. This is what God thinks of our sins. Christ died for our sins. You know, what does God think of my sins? Christ was nailed to the cross. That's what God thinks of our sins. Jesus Christ had to suffer the wrath of God because of our sins. That's what God thinks of our sins. And so when we have no righteousness and God says, this is what I'm doing to your sins. This is what I think of your sins. And we accept that Christ is made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so we accept his death as ours and God accepts our faith and imparts righteousness to us and now we have the righteousness of god well, the jews miss that and, and we can miss it too if our faith is in ourselves if we're trusting in ourselves we'll completely miss the point we're going to miss the point and and not only that we will become um we will become destructive to one another like look look with me at uh the gospel of luke chapter 18 
Luke chapter 18. Because, you know, when Jesus was, when Jesus was ministering in the days of his flesh, um, his greatest opponents were not the, the sodomites and the drunkards and the um, fornicators, the adulterers. His greatest uh, resistance came from the righteous, the religious people, you know, the, the, the zealous people that were zealous for, for their religion. They were the ones that, that opposed him at every point. They were the ones that were continually persecuting him. And we don't want to be in that crowd, right? And so even though, you know, we like to flatter ourselves, say, well, if, if Jesus were here today, I would be all on board. You know, well, I hope, you know, I, I trust that, uh, that we would. But, you know, we're going to find out that sometimes we, we, we trust in ourselves and we find that the Lord can expose our, our hearts. The Lord can expose what's in the, in the inner parts of the heart. And so we don't want to be like Peter who said, Lord, I'm bold. If they, everybody else denies you, I'll not deny you. All these other, you know, low class apostles over here, disciples, they'll, they'll deny you, no doubt, but not me. I'll never deny you. And, you know, he's all bold and has confidence in his flesh and he's zealous for the Lord. And Jesus said, oh, yeah, <laughs> before the night's up, you know, before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice. You know, and the Lord knows how to expose what's in our hearts. And so we have to. We have to reject any confidence in ourselves, any confidence in the flesh. We can't put our faith in what we've done in the past. We can't say, oh, I've done this a hundred times. You know, I've been there. I've done that. Oh, I, I've, I've, you know, I, I've done, I know how to do it. I'm the guy, you know, I'm the go-to guy. It's like when you start putting confidence in yourself, the Lord's going to expose you, which is a good thing. We want the Lord to expose us, but we want him to do it in love and not, you know, not in his anger, not in his wrath. We want the Lord to do it out of his mercies. But then if we're going to, if we're going to follow the path of the Pharisee, if we're going to follow the path of those that trust in themselves, we will become the enemies of the Lord. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus, uh, verse 9. Jesus says, uh, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And look what follows, and despised others. <laughs> this is what happens when we trust in ourselves. We despise other people. We start to look down our nose at other people. His, he's not as holy as I am. He's not as righteous as me. I'm holier than thou. Stand not by me. You know, that's what God said that in the Old Testament. Holier than thou, that came from the Lord's mouth. God was the one that uttered that, you know, and he said that of Israel. That was their arrogance. They said, don't stand next to me. I'm holier than thou. You know, I can't be seen near you. You know, I don't want to be seen in public with you because that'll take my reputation down a notch or two. You know, and that's what happened when Jesus, they said that he, he went and ate with the publicans and the harlots. This man eateth with sinners. Doesn't he understand that, that we're the ones that he ought to be eating with? Why is he over there eating with sinners? Well, he was speaking this parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous because they despise other people. That's exactly what self-righteousness does. When you start to become self-righteous, you start to despise everybody else. You make them lower than you. You esteem them as less important than, than you are. That's, what, that's automatically what happens. Now, you, hopefully, by God's grace, you don't manifest it in words. Oops. <laughs> you don't manifest it in words or actions. But if those thoughts come up in our heart, we need the Lord to show us. We need the Lord to, to, to reveal those things to us so that we can cast them off. And we cannot let this lodge in our hearts, let these thoughts lodge in our hearts to where we despise people and think less of them because they're not as holy as, as we are. You know, we don't want to become Pharisees. But Jesus spoke this parable. He said in verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Not, not a Republican, but a publican. So the publicans were the tax collectors, and they generally, uh, we know, you know, like the IRS, they, um, from what I understand, they could keep, you know, um, whatever they took for the Roman government, uh, they could give that, and whatever they got above that, they got to keep. And so everybody, you know, assumed, and maybe they probably a lot of times did, took more than, than maybe they should have and kept it for themselves, and they tend to prosper with that. That's what happens when you yoke yourself with the enemy, right? The devil will prosper you 
you know, but you'll become the enemy of God and the enemy of God's people. But anyway, um, so the, the publicans were not, they were not highly esteemed among men, to say the least. But they went up to the temple to pray. Well, the Pharisee was highly esteemed among men. So here you have the highest esteemed among men and the lowest esteemed among men going into the, into the temple to pray. The Pharisee, verse 11, stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Can you imagine the arrogance of this guy? Lord, I thank you. I'm not like that guy. <laughs> but I mean, that, you know, that sort of uh, seems like ridiculous uh, to us. But that's people keep people can be that arrogant. They can be that arrogant. But Jesus noticed that he's not praying for the Lord to hear him. He's praying because he likes what he's saying. He likes to hear himself pray, you know. And so when we begin to enter into self-righteousness and we begin to trust in ourselves and we begin to despise other people, we like the praise of men. We like men to begin to tell us, oh, wow, you're doing that. Wow, you're amazing. Wow, you're great. You know, you're, you're wonderful. And so they love the praise of men. And so the Pharisees, what they would tend to do is they would fast to be seen of men. Right? They would say, they'd come out and they'd be all you know, tired, worn out. They'd disfigure their face and... Oh, brother, what happened to you? Did you get in a fight? Oh, I've just been fasting for the Lord. Just been praying, asking the Lord, you know, to have mercy upon people like you, you know. <laughs> and so they would do these things to be seen of men. And, and again, if we're not careful, we'll fall into the same trap. If we start trusting in ourselves, we'll start doing our ministries to be seen of others. We'll start doing our prayers to be heard by others. We'll start doing our almsgiving to be seen. Wow, did you see how much money? You ever seen the, uh, the when the, the guy's donating a big check to, to some charity and they make a big show out of it. And he comes out with this giant check that's like this big. And they're, you know, it's like a piece of plywood and he comes out and, and he's handing it and everybody's clapping. Look how much money this guy's given to this charity. Look at how great he is. And can you imagine if we did that in church? <laughs> you know, he said, bring down your tithes and you bring down this big check, you know. <laughs> And you give it to the pastor and he's a look at this, you know, but I mean, that's basically what vainglory is. That's what the, that's what the Pharisees were in effect doing. They, they'd make this great commotion out and say, all right, everybody, it's time for alms. If you want to receive alms of me, I'm here to give alms. I'm here. Everybody come here. I'm going to give you alms. They make a big show about it. And everybody's like, what's that guy? Oh, he's giving alms. Look at that guy. What a great guy. I actually had a uh, Kevin that, uh, out in the streets the other week, this, uh, this guy comes up to me and he tells me to quit preaching. You know, you're mess, you're just ruining everything. Don't talk about Jesus. And, and he said, you should help this homeless guy here. And it was a homeless guy on the bench. Well, we tried to help this guy before. We talked to him multiple times. And then he comes over and he's like, he's like, you should help this guy. And he comes down, he pulls some money out. And he's like, he's showing me how I should be helping this guy by giving him money. I'm like, the guy doesn't want help. I mean, he'll take your money. But he doesn't want help. And so you're not helping him. You're just facilitating the guy. You're just, but he's virtue signaling. He's trying to show me, look, this is how you do it. This is how you be nice. They don't, this preaching stuff, you got to stop that. You know, you just give money to poor people. You give money to drunks. You give money to these drug addicts. And that's, that's what's going to help them. I mean, that might help them get their next fix. They might help them get dinner so they can take their money to get the next fix. But that's not helping them. Jesus Christ will help them. You know, Jesus Christ will forgive them. Jesus Christ will regenerate them. He'll restore them. And so we ought to be preaching the gospel. But we shouldn't be doing our works to be seen of men. And, you know, if we're out there preaching to be seen of men, then woe unto us. We ought not to be doing that. If we're doing these things to be seen of men, that's the point here is that we start to trust in ourselves and we'll start to despise other people. And then if somebody isn't as impressed with us as we are with ourselves, we get offended. Oh, brother, did you hear that word I gave? Man, I said, well, you could have maybe toned it down or you could have maybe, uh, you know, revved it up a little bit. There's a couple of things you could have done with that. Like, Who's this guy? Who does he think he is? I'm holier than he is, and he's going to tell me? And they despise him. See, this is the operation of self-righteousness. This is what self-righteousness does. This is what it looks like. It's ugly. It's arrogant. And so this, this Pharisee is praying thus with himself. He's thanking God that he is. And, you know, it's okay to thank God that we're not what we used to be, right? We ought to all be thankful that we're not what we used to be. 
But when we're not praying to God and we're praying to, to hear ourselves pray and to be seen of other men, um, this is what the Lord despises. And this is why Jesus is telling them this parable. And so he says, um, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So here he is bragging about his works. And the publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes un unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, your sin, uh, when you feel the guilt and the weight of sin and the, and the, and the, the, the load that sin puts upon you, upon your conscience, um, you're not puffed up. You're not arrogant. You're broken. And you feel that brokenness. You know, sometimes God uses men's own sins to chastise them. He'll use their own backslidings to chasten them. And so you can be so wrecked in your sins that you're just broken. You say, God, save me from my sins. Help me. Deliver me from this uh, alcoholism. Deliver me from this drug addiction. Deliver me from this lust. I just can't find, I, I just can't find escape from this. And, and you're broken. God, be merciful to me. Well, the Lord's bringing that guy to, re to repentance through his sins. And the other guy is so full of himself and so trusting in himself and so proud of himself that he's despising the work of God. God is working. I mean, he should have been thinking, wow, that, that guy's in the temple. He's praying. This must be the work of God. God has brought a sinner into to the midst of us. And he's, he's wanting uh, direction. He's wanting help. He's wanting prayer. And we ought to be the ones that are over there trying to encourage them, trying to pray with them, trying to give them the gospel. Say, here's how you can have your sins remitted. Here's how you can be forgiven. Here's how you can have, be set free from that burden of sin. Christ died for your sins. He can wash you from your sins in his own blood. And we minister this to the, to the sinners and we encourage them and we try to give them faith and we try to uh, uh, pull them out of these sins. And we try to give them the, the power of the resurrection of Christ through the gospel. And so they can recover themselves and they can walk in newness of the spirit. But see, when we're self-righteous, we despise anything that's not up to our par, up to our standard. It's not like we are. But he says that the, the publican here said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says here, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So the way to overcome self-righteousness is to humble yourself. You know, do the dirty jobs. Do the things that nobody sees you doing. Do things to not be seen of men. You know, keep your mouth shut about other people. Right? That, that's probably one of the main things is, is just don't be, um, don't be talking and, 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 and slandering and being envious and speaking out a heart of envy and out a heart of bitterness against other people. That's humbling ourselves. And Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. So the man that came down with a heart of brokenness and he cried to God to be merciful to him, a sinner, went justified. His sins were washed away. They were remitted. But the other went condemned. The opposite of justification is, is condemnation. So here the man that trusted in himself left condemned and the man that had no confidence in himself left justified. And this is what we need to consider. We need to think about this in our own lives. If we start drifting into a, a mindset of vainglory and self-confidence, putting confidence in our flesh and look at me, did anybody see me? We start thinking these things. We are immediately following into a, a self-righteous trap where we're going to despise other people. We're going to we're, we're going to look down at other people. And we're ultimately those are the ones that killed Jesus. And we're going to be guilty of trying to interfere with the work of God. God's going to be doing some work in our midst. And we're going to say, like, remember when Joshua, Joshua, Noah, or Noah, Joshua and Moses, um, when Moses, uh, they were, he had put the, the spirit that was upon Moses, upon the 70 elders. And, and Joshua came to, to Moses and said, Moses, there's, there's uh, uh, two men down in the camp. Or I'm sorry, one man came to, and told them, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And, and, and Joshua said, my Lord Moses, forbid them. You know, stop them. They're not, they're not under our ministry. They, I've not checked them out. I've not vetted them. What are they doing down there prophesying? <laughs> And so we get this attitude that we're the spiritual police, you know, and we need to make sure well, if it's going to be going on 
And if it's going to be of God, I'm the one that's got to check it out. I've got to make sure that it, it meets my qualifications. And it, of course, it's got to meet the Bible qualifications, no doubt. If it's not, it, you know, if it's not of the, if it's not of God, uh, it's not going to match His Word. But the thing is, also, you can match up the things of God with His Word and still be like a Pharisee. And that's what we want to avoid this morning. That's what we're focused on this this morning. Is we want to be justified before the Lord. And the way we're justified before the Lord is to have no confidence in ourselves. To have no confidence. And to have only confidence in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now turn to Matthew 19. I'm trying to drag this out as long as I can. But you know, Ben's got a gift for this. You know, he, can, uh, he can give you two sermons in one. And... Uh, <laughs> He might hear that later. I might want to. Matthew 19. And we're going to see one more example of, of self righteousness in operation. Uh oh. Oh, man. Well. <laughs> well. Well, look at uh, Matthew chapter 19, and we'll start in verse 16. And we know the story. It's not, it's, it's not a new story here. This is, uh, but I want to think about it from the, from the uh, perspective of, of self-righteousness. It said, Behold, one came and said unto him, this is to Jesus, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And of course the reprobates immediately seize upon this and say, Oh, Jesus is saying he's not God. You know, and Jesus is not saying he's not God. He's just saying, Why are you going around calling people good? Only God is good. And of course Jesus said he's a good shepherd, right? You know, the, the Bible says that Christ is righteous, that he did no sin, there was no guile in his mouth, that he... Uh, you know, kept the law of God. He was a spotless lamb of God. So he's not saying that he's not good. He's just saying this guy has the wrong perspective of good. And he goes around throwing it around like it's, you know, like it's Federal Reserve notes <laughs> with, with the government, you know. Uh, but so he's just going around calling people good and he, he's not sober about it. He doesn't think about who he's calling good. He's using it almost as a term of flattery. You know, and so Jesus is trying to bring him back down and say, hey, why are you, why are you calling people good? Only God is good. And, and he says, um, verse 17, if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, some, again, uh, other reprobates will grab a hold of this scripture and say, oh, this works based salvation. Jesus said you got to be keep the commandments to be saved. You know, well, you missed the point. You can't keep the commandments to be saved. And if you, that's that's what we're talking about this morning. The Jews followed after the law of righteousness and didn't attain into it because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. They didn't receive the righteousness of God because they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And they despise other people. So Jesus is not saying, oh, if you want to get to heaven, start laboring and then working in the commandments and eventually you'll get there. That's not what he's saying. He's showing him that the, the law is good if, is, if a man uses it lawfully. Well, Jesus is getting ready to show us how to use the law lawfully. He says, uh, the young man said in verse 20, uh, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus, now Jesus has taken the law and he's sticking it into the man's heart. And Jesus is going to show him what's really going on in his heart. He says, if thou will be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And if you read Mark's gospel, Mark says that he looking on him, loved him. Like Jesus is saying this out of a love for this man. But he sees that this man is in absolute danger of losing his soul and so jesus said sell all you have give to the poor come take up the cross and follow me you'll have treasure in heaven but it says in verse 22 but the when the young man heard that saying he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions so was the man righteous had he kept the commandments yeah from his youth up was that enough no 
Because when it came down to real, genuine, loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, he was, he was missing that. That was the whole point of the law. The law was given not to make us righteous, not to put confidence in ourselves, but the law was given to show that we're not righteous. The law was given to show, that, like Paul said, I had not known lust except the law has said thou shalt not covet. And then when, when the law is revealed, we begin to say, oh, I'm not, I'm not righteous. I'm not keeping the law with all my heart. The Bible says if you love God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, then you fulfill the whole law. Well, do you love your neighbor with all your heart as yourself? Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? You know? Well, I mean, what if the Lord said, hey, sell all you have, give to the poor, and come take up the cross and follow me? Would you say, well, that must not be the Lord. That's, uh, I don't know what that is. That, that, well, the Lord surely wouldn't tell me to do that. Well, the Lord's going to show the thoughts and the intents of our hearts by putting us in situations that expose it. You know, like Peter. Peter, again, he was saying, oh, I, I, can, I can fight off these, you know, Lord, we're, we're going to fight these Romans. We're going to overcome. We're going to defeat uh, the enemy. Well, the Lord showed him that all that, all that uh, fluff and all that zeal was, was vacuous when it came down to it. it. It was just, it was nothing more than self-righteousness. It was nothing more than arrogance. And so Jesus exposed it. Jesus, in effect, um, revealed, and it was the same thing with, his, with the rich young ruler here. He revealed what was really in the man's heart. So he wanted to do something to get to heaven. He thought, well, I'll keep the commandments. I'm doing pretty good. I'm, and he was probably comparing himself to his neighbor's. He's probably looking at his neighbors saying, well, I'm more zealous than they are. Surely I'm going to make it to heaven. I do more than that guy does. You know, I pray twice in the week. I give tithes of all I possess. So surely I'm going to make it to heaven. And Jesus said, well, okay, if you want to be perfect, then sell all you have and give to the poor. See, God exposes what's really in our hearts through hard situations, hard uh, uh, trials and, and uh, challenges. He puts us in situations that challenge us. So that we're, as Paul said, pressed out of measure above strength in so much that Paul said that he despaired even of life. So when the Lord begins to put us in situations where we're not comfortable, when we can't do it, we don't have the skill, we don't have the strength, we don't have the ability, then we realize, God, be merciful to me. Help me, Lord. I need your help. Well, that's, that's the man that's going to be justified with God. That's the man that's going to be right with God is the man that walks in that attitude and a woman that walks in that attitude that they have no confidence in themselves. They have full confidence. And if God's called us to do it, then he's able to perform it. If God's called me to go to El Salvador, then, then the Lord's going to bring it to pass. Like if the Lord's called me into this prayer meeting and even nobody else shows up, but I'm going to do it by God's grace. It's going to get done because the excellence of the power is of God. And if God's called me to do it, I'm going to do it. You know, and so our faith is in uh, not ourselves, but our faith is in what God has called us to do. God, our faith is in his power. And, and so if the Lord says, sell all you have to give to the poor, then we need to say the same thing. Well, Lord, I, you're going to have to help me with that. But uh, I believe that if you call me to do it, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You'll provide my needs according to your riches and glory. Can you imagine, though, think about it, you know, it's, it's harder for us to, you know, we think if the Lord called us to do that today, I mean, we would be sort of like by ourselves. It wouldn't be with actually with Jesus, you know. But Jesus is here in the flesh, the incarnate word of God in the flesh, you know, from everlasting to everlasting, according to the prophets told when he was going to show up. And here he is in the flesh. Jesus Christ, and he's talking to this man. I mean, can you imagine that, that if you're talking to Jesus and he says to do this, wouldn't you think, well, yeah, I get to follow Jesus. I get to walk with the Lord. I get to see the, the work of his, uh, of his miracles, the ministry of the Lord. Wow, that's, that's an opportunity. Instead, he was like, well, I'm comfortable and I don't think God, you know, we start, we start interpreting the Lord's will based on our comfort zone. You know, that's what to be carnally minded means to do. The lust of our flesh, the pleasures of the flesh began to infect our thinking. And we start interpreting, well, I don't know if this is God or not. Why? Well, because it would require that I become uncomfortable. And so it must not be the Lord because the Lord wants me, you know, to be comfortable in my comfort zone. And, 
And so if anything starts to jerk me out of my comfort zone, that I can't be of God. Well, you need to read the Bible a little bit because that's exactly what the Lord did all from beginning to end. You know, he told Abraham, hey, come out of your father's house into some land you've never been to, you've never seen, you've never heard of. Come on over. And he's like, well, all right, <laughs> I guess I guess the Lord will be there. Uh, but no, and he told him, that, well, the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. His faith was counted for righteousness. And so we, we I don't want to go on and, and uh, uh, belabor this point too much, but uh, I, I just want us to see that if the Lord calls us into a ministry, he's with us as much as if he were in the flesh here now. As a matter of fact, he said, it is expedient for you that I go away because the comforter will come. The Holy Ghost will come. And if the Lord is calling us out to do a work or if he's empowering us or he's putting in something on our heart to do, he's, he is with us. He has not forsaken us. He's going to empower us. He's going to uh, guide our steps. He's going to direct our paths. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. God is going to lead you by his Spirit. But... When God does these things, he is also going to expose the weaknesses and, the, and, the, and the, the struggles that are within us. He's going to expose the things that are in our heart that uh, maybe we don't love our brother as we ought to. Maybe we don't love our sister as we ought to. Maybe we're not as kind and patient and long-suffering as we ought to be with one another or with the lost. You know? And so if we abide in the Lord, God will expose these things. But, but the, you know, thanks be unto God that he's given us the victory. You know, Christ, when we think of his death and resurrection, his death crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. All the things in us that are contrary to God have been nailed to the cross. They've been crucified with Christ. And everything that God wants in us is in the power of his resurrection. And, and we are partakers. We're born again by the resurrection of Christ. We have the Spirit of God in us because God breathed into us and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. God's Spirit is in us. And so everything that we need is, is already supplied to us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so don't shy back from hard things, from difficult things that God has called us to do because He will empower you to do it. And don't get self-confident and lazy and start to trust in yourself because you're going to end up like a Pharisee. It's not going to look good on the day of judgment. Can you imagine, you know, as Christians, our works are going to be tried. We're not going to be uh, uh, judged according to our, uh, you know, like a sinner on the great white throne judgment. When we stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, our works are going to be judged. And if our works are all built on self-confidence, the vain glory to be seen of men, it's all going to be burned up. And we're going to be embarrassed and ashamed before Jesus Christ on the day of judgment. But we don't have to be. We just have to be honest, be sincere, and, and trust in God. Trust in the Lord. Don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to be stronger than you, than you are. The Bible says if we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, we, we deceive ourselves. You know, and we, we need to just trust that, that God called us into a work, that He is faithful. He is just. He's not going to leave us or forsake us. He's going to cause us to triumph. He's going to fulfill the calling, the ministry, the work, uh, even to the end. We can finish our course with faith. We can finish what God's called us to do. But don't lapse into self-righteousness. Don't lapse into self-confidence. All right? And that's all I got for you today. I don't want to beat you up too much here <laughs> this morning. But, but let's just trust the Lord. Don't ever get our eyes off of, of Christ. Don't ever get our eyes off of His righteousness into our own righteousness. All right? Let's close in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your word. God, we know many times your word divides asunder the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. And we just ask you to search us. God, help us not to put any confidence in ourselves. Help us not to be self-righteous. Help us not to be like Pharisees and hypocrites, God. And just pray that you'll help us to be sincere without offense until the day of Jesus Christ. God, that you'll empower each person here, Lord, that you will fill them with the knowledge of your will, that you will quicken the, the gifts and the, the calling that's in their lives, Lord, that as the body, as members of the body of Christ, God, we're all different. Help us not to condemn one another, to judge one another. God, help us to encourage and pray for one another, to love one another, and Lord, to dwell together in unity. And I just pray, God, that you will work 
your spirit within us, God. That, that's your, your body. Lord, we are your body. We are your people. Lord, and, and Lord, your name is in us. And we just pray that we'll be able to carry your name out into the lost, into the community. And whatever way that, Lord, that you've called us and you empower us to do, Lord, help us to be winning the lost. Help us to seek and to save that which is lost. Lord, and, and to love sinners as you've loved them and as you love us. Help us to be like you, God. And we pray in the process of that, Lord, that you will bring to light any of these hidden things in our hearts, into the recesses of our hearts, God, if we have any confidence in ourselves. Lord, if we have any, any self-righteousness, if we despise anyone, Lord, because of our own arrogance, we just pray, forgive us, Lord, for these things. Help us not to be like this, Lord, not to be, Lord, just a, a stench in your nostrils. God, a, a smoke, as you said in the scriptures, Lord, a smoke in your nose, Lord, just an irritant unto you. God, help us to be well-pleasing, to offer sacrifices of praise, to be a, Lord, a, a sacrifice that is well-pleasing to you. We present our bodies, Lord, as a living sacrifice unto you. Just use us for your glory. We just thank you again for your great mercy and for your love wherewith you loved us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, just bless us today. Lord, I pray for your blessing upon everyone here. Multiply your mercy and your blessings upon them, God. Just pray that your peace will keep their hearts and their minds through Jesus Christ. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, anybody have anything you want to add or any songs you want to sing? We're still open. All right, Lord bless you guys.